This episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast is driven by Cornerstone Gundog Academy. CGA is the world's most comprehensive online gundog training resource. They've got over 160 instructional videos that includes everything you need to take your seven-week-old puppy to a finished gundog. Visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com to sign up for their free preview module and begin your training journey today. Cornerstone Gundog Academy, the most advanced gundog training resource on the web. You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, episode 143. This week on the show, we're talking about one of the most controversial and difficult to understand at times regulations on the books. We're talking waterfowl baiting laws. All right. Welcome to episode 143 of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast. I'm your host, Josh Palm. This week, we're brought to you by Yukonubo. Went out in the field. How you've prepared determines how you'll perform with balanced fat and protein su- to support peak condition. You can do a premium dog food, enhances strength, energy, and endurance. So when the pavement ends and the truck doors finally swing open, you and your dogs are ready for anything. Strong, focused, and ready for anything. That's a you can a dog. Joining me this week, as he always does, my co-host Dan Hrushka. Dan, what's up? Hey, man. I am, um, I guess, ro- rolling through a honeydew list okay. re- recently. Um the wife decided that she uh, wanted all of our trim and doors painted white, so that's super fun because they're wood. And um, <laughs> I got well. The thing is, I I did a lot. Does she when not it, know how to paint? I, mean, <laughs> I don't think so. Honest question. Uh, I don't think so. But <laughs> so so I got a lot done during uh, winter time, just because there's nothing else to do really, um, like after season. So. I got like half of it done. She's like, that's really bothering me. She she texted me that today. And I was like, you know what? I am not going to use a brush and then roll it like I've been doing because it takes me so long to do because I have to do multiple coats. I said, after work, I'm going to Home Depot. I'm going to buy one of those sprayers. And that is what I did. And I got two doors done and absolutely no time whatsoever. It was really fun, kind of. And, uh, yeah, so I'm still wearing the same shorts that have spray all over it. So they're black and kind of misty white now. That was cool. Kind of not neat, but yeah. Okay. So that was, that was really cool. Boy, that, that, that we went down a rabbit hole there. All right. Yeah. Well, glad you're painting. Um, Glad, <laughs> glad our listeners are here with us that just uh, sat through that. If they're yep. new to the show, they can hear more of that kind of nonsense from you um <laughs> I tease. And on past episodes you can check us out at hpoutdoors.com find all the episodes over there you can go to uh, social media you can find us on facebook twitter and instagram you can check out all of the databases out there that have quality podcast content you can find our show itunes stitcher spotify all the good ones out there have our program and this week we are talking uh one of the Most controversial and often difficult to understand blind laws. It's changed over the years. So we're going to, or blind laws, baiting laws, uh, waterfowl baiting laws uh, have changed over the years. And we're going to talk a little bit about that this week because it's it's a topic that you don't, I haven't seen covered much um, in depth by a lot of uh, shows out there, any if if, that I'm aware of. But uh, it's one that, you know, if you don't know what you're kind of, not allowed to do and things like that. Like you can find yourself in hot water almost inadvertently. Um, but we'll, we'll get into that a little bit, a little bit more here in a few minutes. But before we do, I do want to just take a minute to thank Gunner Kennels. They're engineered for your dog designed for travel and built for your peace of mind. The G one kennel set a new industry standard and put Gunner in a category all its own. They were started to protect your pet and it continues to be at the center of everything they do. And Gunner's dedicated to building the best and safest pet travel crate on the market today because man's best friend deserves man's best kennel check out their g1 series of kennels and accessories at gunnerkennels.com also thank you to 737 duck and goose calls their original designs select grade components superior sound and unparalleled service 737 takes exceptional pride in producing the finest quality best built premium calls on the market today 
They're made right here in America and offered only direct to consumers through their websites. Shipping in the U.S. is always free, and international orders are also now accepted online. A 20-day money-back guarantee and a lifetime warranty accompanies every call purchased. 737 duck calls lead the flock. Um, okay, so I wanted before we get into the baiting law thing, I, I feel like I've seen just puppy galore going out the door this this time of year. Um, I know. SOK had a, a pickup weekend here recently, and a lot of guys in our listeners group and stuff are, are uh, got Southern Oak Kennel dogs already. But you know, there's there's a lot of puppies that are coming out, and I'm seeing a lot of guys, you know, utilizing Gunner kennels or their their quality kennel of choice. And um, I got to be honest with you, my dog is a complete disaster right now. So I think I'm out on the puppy game. Like I think this will be my last dog. Like I don't think I'll own another one. He's just constantly having this done, that done. He had surgery recently. Got to take him in tomorrow to get stitches out and stuff. I'm just kind of over it, man. I got to be honest with you. I'm a little bit over it. So he always has the ear infections. Do you want to tell listeners what you dealt with recently? I mean, I don't think I need to go into super detail on that. I just He just had a surgery. Um, so he's been in the lampshade for, I don't know, probably three or four weeks now because – uh, what he had operated on had to be um, was infected from him chewing it and stuff, uh, like in one day, literally, it like blew up. Mm. So we had to get it to where they could actually operate on it before um, we did anything. So he spent about ten days in the cone there, had the surgery. It's been fourteen days in the cone there, uh, plus or minus, plus a few days. So uh, yeah, you know, and he doesn't do well on antibiotics, so he throws up a lot with that. And it's just constant, you know, I feel bad for the guy. He's constantly got something going on, but I mean, it's just a drain, you know, time financially, like all that stuff is tough. So, you know, I know a lot of guys have questions about the cost of dogs and I, I mean, you know, people say it, but I don't know if I certainly didn't appreciate what it could be when I bought my dog, because I've definitely played more in vet bills than I ever would have anticipated having. Is he before. still, is he still pretty hyper? Um, well, not lately because he's been, you know, in the cone and kind of like sequestered off in our house because, um, you know, he can still like, like when he wears the cone, he gets really chafed and irritated around his neck. So he like Man. tries to scratch it and gets cuts because he licks the inside of the cone. So it's like constantly moist in there. Right. Yeah. And it just like, he gets cuts and it bleeds and he stinks. Like it's just terrible. Um, so yeah, not... <laughs> Not a great experience, my dog. <laughs> so let me let me ask you this: When you picked him out, because he how old is he now? Uh he's like ten, or he'll 10. be ten this fall. Yeah, um, ten years ago, did you do much research on the breeder or any of the lines on him? I mean, I didn't do like a significant amount because he's not a hunting dog. wasn't really bought to be a hunting dog. He's right. just a house dog. He's just a purebred golden retriever. So, like, you know, I looked at some of the stuff, but, I mean, I didn't, like, um, you know, I didn't go, like, to the extent that a lot of people do probably, like, when they're looking at, you know, whatever, hunting dogs and things like yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, I, I didn't care about any of that. I feel bad for the dude, like you said. That yeah, can't I mean, be fun. Sucks. Yeah. So, but it's, t it's totally, like, my wife is completely out. Like, she's done. There's no even, it's not even a negotiation. It's just not happening. No more dogs. Nope. And frankly, I'm kind of with her. So, <laughs> <laughs> so are you just cat people now? No, when that thing dies, it's they're done. Too. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I've never been a cat person. <laughs> no. Uh, when, that's, when that cat's gone, we're done there too. So we'll just be we'll be pet free. It'd be great. I don't have like hair rolling around in my hallways all the time. It'd be awesome. That is the worst. You don't have to like go to work and like have just dog hair all over your stuff. It's yep. Just, just cool. Yeah. Be good. Oh man. We took um so we went on vacation over the fourth down to North Carolina and took Kimber with us. It was the longest trip she's ever been on. <clears throat> and before we went down, I vacuumed the van, had it looking Pristine. just so sharp. So sharp. <laughs> And, uh, oh man, we, I mean, we put like blankets down, not blankets, but, uh, like area rugs that fit in there with this, when, when it covered in hair. Oh, it was, yeah. Anywhere that 
that the little rugs weren't is just covered. And it was dude, that's in your house. I mean, that's the thing. Like that's in your house. <laughs> well, now, yeah, now that we have the hardwood floor, it it, it uh, like you said, it's the the what do you call them? The dust balls or the tumbleweeds? The yeah. tumble tumbleweeds. Ever well between her and Cody. Oh, All yeah. right. Well, Cody's long hair, so yeah. like Cameron's got the short like little needles. <laughs> I call them yeah. for labs. Like yeah. my dog's got long hair too, so they just like ball up in the yeah. corner and it's yeah. like tumbleweeds, you know, kind of blown around. <laughs> Um, but you know, he'll like get up, right. And he'll just, sh- he'll like, you know, when there's like sun coming through the window and he'll just shake when he stands up and I just see the fur just flying off him. And I'm just like, Oh my God. Like <laughs> not, not, not great. Anyway. Uh, so I had an interesting, uh, experience last night at baseball practice that I thought was funny. Yeah. So I'm throwing batting practice to the kids and I'm sitting right in front of the pitcher's mound uh, on a bucket, just throwing to the kids. And I hear behind me, like some of the kids start screaming, not screaming, but like just yelling and kind of like, I can tell something's going on. So I turn around and there's a hen mallard standing in the infield and she's just kind of like looking around. Right. And the kids are kind of like walking around. So she's nervous. I have no idea why she's there, where she came from. We'd been practicing for like an hour and a half. Like, I don't know what brought her that at that point, but like, it's not like she was there right. all, all practice, right? She just showed up in the infield. So, you know, I'm telling the kids like, just leave her be like, she'll go off or whatever. She's walking like three feet behind me when I'm on the bucket, just <laughs> hanging out and the kids are hitting balls. And then she starts chasing them. Like she's getting mad at the baseballs. And she's like running after him, trying to like attack him. <laughs> what? Yeah, it was it was the wildest thing. Uh, I mean, it was cool because the kids like you know got to be real close to like a wild duck and stuff, which was neat. But like, you know, I just I wasn't really I couldn't understand like what was going on, like why it was there and it was acting that way. It just seemed very strange. And that field's so. played on all the time. It's not like she has oh, a net constantly. I mean, it's yeah. There's always well, she should have. She should have babies somewhere, but right. That's what I, I was thinking. Like, there, I don't, I don't think there was a place. There's no water nearby. Like, I don't think she would have really been nesting there, or rate, you know, had a clutch there or anything. Like, I don't know what she was doing there, and she wasn't there for like an hour and a half. So she had to like fly in and just light in the infield, and, and then and then get mad about the situation. Yeah, just get irritated and Ugh. go all ham on people. And then I turned around and I just kept throwing BP. I'm like, well, she'll figure it out. And then, I, you know, she was gone. So I don't know if she flew off or what, but um, yeah, because I, I initially a couple of the kids tried to like kind of chase her a little bit when they first landed and she wasn't like flying off. She sort of like ran away, but she didn't fly away and she just came right back. So it was weird. Speaking of not flying away. So I made a post in our, in our Facebook listeners group. Um, just said, I want some funny hunting stories, you know, just to get people thinking about hunting and good times in the blind stuff. <clears throat> one that stands out in my mind and had me absolutely cracking up. The one, the one guy wrote that his friend can't hit anything when it's flying. So if there's a bird that lands, it's like his shot. He gets to water swat <laughs> it. Right. <laughs> so the one, the one they were hunting and, uh, a merganser, uh, swam into their decoys. So they're like, go ahead, you know, and, and he shot it and went out and the thing literally only had one wing. Like it could not, it could not fly it. It had never, it wasn't like ripped off or anything. It, it just had one wing. It literally could not fly. And they posted a picture of him holding it and it had me laughing so hard. <laughs> Did he mount it? That was like his, that duck was like born for him. Yeah. It was like his thing. Uh, was it a Drake at least? Uh, I don't think so. Not oh, from man. the, not from the picture. That's funny. Uh, That's funny. I I just had a quick look at the picture, but it was, uh, yeah, that had me rolling. There's a lot of funny ones. We're going to have to do a, a short segment and let me read some of them. But that one had me, had me cracking up for sure. Hmm. Yeah, I saw that you'd posted that, but I hadn't read it right in the comments yet. But all right, let's shift gears here a little bit and talk about the topic of the week, which is waterfowl baiting laws. And the reason why we wanted to deep dive into this a little bit is is several fold. One, waterfowl laws in general, I think, are one of the most um, difficult to interpret a lot of times for people. And there's so much variation between the federal regulation and then how the state set. I think, I think understanding the regulations is something that prevents people from getting into the sport. 
like reading them, trying to un- understand them. Like in our state where we have uh, blind laws in, in, in addition to bait laws, uh, I think people are, are scared off by that to an extent. So the idea here is to hopefully, uh, you know, make some clarity of this particular regulation so that people have a better understanding of what they're dealing with here. But then also, I think that there's probably a lot of things that even experienced hunters may not know about this this uh, regulation, or if they do know, it's a good refresher because, as we'll talk about, some of the fines for this this infraction can be significant, mm-hmm. and um, you know you definitely don't want to be on the wrong side of that one. And frankly, I learned a lot about this because where I hunt, I just don't really think about baiting as a thing much. I don't hunt a lot of ag fields. You know, I'm hunting like tidal marshes and things like that, so I just don't really worry about it much. But uh, I think that there's probably, you know. A lot, a lot to unpack that people probably should think about when they when they hunt. So we'll kind of get into all that. And um, you got I thought something. You wanna, well, I was just going to say I thought something that was cool. I think what did we do? Like five five things or ten things new hunters should know. And there were a lot of experienced hunters that said, "Hey, thanks for bringing that up because I didn't know that." You mm. know. So I think, um, and you know, fifteen twenty years waterfowl hunting, you would think that you're experienced and know everything, but it you don't, you might not, you might, right. you might not. So, you know, this is for new hunters trying to get in, but it's also, like you said, some of the fines, I I wouldn't even guess what some of the fines were. Yeah. They could be significant. So, so yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I guess maybe do a little history kind of to leading up to where we are and, and we're not going to scrub this super in depth history wise, but um, I think well, first, do you want to, uh, Let's first tell them what Virginia has on their website as far as the baiting. Well, okay. Because if someone's looking, you know, like Virginia baiting laws and right. they don't so understand if you go, if you go to the, um, you know, Department of Game and Fish Virginia website and you look up waterfowl regulations and things like that, tucked in there under no person shall take migratory game birds – the very last bullet in that little section is by the aid of baiting or on or over any baited area where a person knows or reasonably should know that the area is or has been baited. Now, that, if you don't know anything about a baiting law, like maybe that sounds reasonable to you, but... There is so much ambiguity in that statement when you actually know what the law says. It's hard to it's hard for me to justify like the way that's written because it has it doesn't tell you what what constituting what constitutes baiting. It doesn't tell you how large a baited area is or is considered to to be baited um, around you know how much area around a particular bait spot is considered to also be baited. Uh It also does not elaborate on what it means that a person reasonably should know that the area is or has been baited. Um, It doesn't talk to you about what you do if an area, if you do know that an area has been baited, how long do you have to wait before you can hunt that spot? There's so much to unpack there. So, I mean, it's there, but if that's all you're going off of, you're missing a lot of this regulation. And then in contrast, Pennsylvania and Obviously, we're just doing our home states, but you go to their their migratory bird page and it kind of says, you know, bag limits and seasons must conform to framework set by U.S. Fish and Wildlife. But then below that is a link to federal waterfowl regulations. So there's no talk of baiting or anything um, kind of high level like Virginia has. And it just takes you straight to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife baiting laws and and whatnot so right and i and i probably i do want to caveat all of this the conversation that we're about to have with we are citing information directly from the u.s fish and wildlife service and other uh websites and things that we we deem to be creditable with the most recent information that we're aware of available so i say all that to mean what we say today means nothing (laughs) For your hunting situation, make sure you look for yourself and are comfortable. Talk to a warden if need be, but ensure that you're working off the most current uh, regulations for not only the federal statute, but also 
anything that your state would have uh, in addition. So sort yes. of the, the legal uh, disclaimer there, if you will. HP is not liable for anything that you do. That is correct. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> All right. So I wanted to just kind of give a brief little like sort of how we got here with this kind of stuff. And most people probably know this, but for those that don't, um, a lot of a lot of the federal regulations and things like that um, are driven from the Migratory Bird Treaty Act of 1918, was which is what the original uh, statute was, and what that was. Um, the statute was <laughs> it's 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 funny. It's the original 1918 statute was actually implemented, um, and the uh, 1916 uh, convention between the U.S. Uh, Great Britain at the time, which for, for Canada, and basically uh, it was for the protection of migratory birds, and then they amended it sort of later and implemented uh, the same sort of arrangements with Mexico, Japan, and the Soviet Union, now Russia. So this has sort of been that whole why things are federally regulated, because migratory birds cover a lot of land mass, so, um, you know, trying to stay consistent with regulations and things like that and protections, um, you know across countries and some of this stuff I've got sort of some of my notes are all spread out but one of the things when I was researching sort of when baiting laws became a thing right um, I'm going to read a little bit of this but I'll try to paraphrase best I can this is an old article I, I don't exactly know when it was uh, written but it talks about why these these things were, um, these implementations and regulations were needed because, uh, so it says like by 1900 waterfowl populations had been essentially cut in half. And in 1918, U S Canada, uh, them later, the other countries, they signed the uh, migratory bird treaty act. Basically what this did was that it ended the sale of waterfowl. It banned spring shooting. It shortened the fall seasons and set the bag limit, the daily bag limit to 25 ducks and eight geese. Um, and basically talks about, um, later in 1934, the federal duck stamp program, uh, started and shortly thereafter is when, uh, baiting and the use of live decoys became banned. Um, so sort of 1934 per this article is when this kind of became a thing. And at that time they also banned automatic and repeating uh, shotguns, uh, or, I'm sorry, they didn't ban them. They automatic and repeating shotguns had to be plugged. So they could hold no more than three shells, same kind of deal today, and no larger than 10 gauge was uh, legal. So anything over 10 gauge. Um, so basically, 1934 is, from what I could tell, when this kind of regulation was put into place. So, um, you know, I think you... No more, to- no more punt guns. Yeah. Well, I th- yeah. And I think you, you kind of referred to um, an article where, you know, people used to bait commonly just to ensure they got their limit, not necessarily to always like shoot a hundred ducks at a time. Right. Right. So that was 19, that was 1980. Yeah. So I think, I think there was a, so some of the research that I found is that while this regulation was in place, it was sort of loosely enforced for oh, quite a ni- while. Ni- 1966 yeah. is when federal agents started really uh, cracking right. down. Yeah. Yeah, so the, the the law was on the books, but it kind of seems to have been loosely enforced uh, for a period of time, and then it started to ratchet up and get a little bit more, um, more uh, you know, enforceable and things like that. So I wanted to just kind of highlight, I think, uh, a couple sort of landmark changes in the regulations over time before we get into really like what the regulation is today. And sort of get through some of that stuff. Does that make sense to you, Dan? Yep. All right. So basically, uh, let's see here. It looks like a major revision took place from the Migratory Bird Treaty uh, Reform Act in 1998. And basically, um, this was sort of a landmark moment for baiting is concerned. Because at this point in time... Uh, at, at, at up until this point, the, the law basically said that there was a strict liability standard for the enforcement of baiting regulations. So what that would mean is if you were hunting a baited area, whether you knew it was baited or not, you were guilty of hunting a baited area. So the example would be you go to a hunt with an outfitter, 
they take you out to a pond or a, something and they drop you off. They say, okay, shooting light, legal shooting lights here. Like this is your limit, you know, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to go check on another hunting group. I'll be back at like 10, whatever. So the guide rolls out, shooting light comes on, birds start dumping in the hole. You shoot, you shoot a couple ducks, you retrieve them up. And all of a sudden you hear a game warden behind you, ask you to unload your gun and that you're arrested for hunting a baited, baited area. At that time, you were guilty as charged for hunting bait. Whether you knew that guide baited that spot or not was irrelevant. You were guilty. So that really puts you in a tough spot, Dan. I mean, you know, like, you know, what do you what do you what are you supposed to do in that situation if if that's what the law says? I mean, you're kind of screwed. Right. Like how many times when we go hunting somewhere, we usually show up at midnight, two in the morning, and we're up at four thirty to go out to a field. We have not checked that field or water or whatever it is. And that would be uh yeah, usually innocent till proven guilty, but not in that case. Yeah. So the law was definitely not in the favor of the hunter, you know, the, the hunter trying to do the right thing, right? Because, I mean, there's just a million ways you could walk into a, a charge for baiting. So in, in the Reform Act of 98, they changed from strictly li- uh, strict liability to the known or should have known standard. So this was something that was kind of, I mean, I think there was a lot of mostly support for this, but there were some states, I think Maryland was one, that was against this regulation because they felt that going to a known or should have known standard would have been, was more difficult to enforce than previous regulations, which does make sense. I mean, essentially the warden now has to bring the bur- has they bear the burden of proof against those that are being charged, which... I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, that's sort of how our justice system is built, right? I mean, innocent until proven guilty. So now it's on the warden to prove that you either know, knew or should have known that that area is baited. Um, What constitutes should have known? I I don't know. But basically, um, you know, at the time, basically they were saying federal wardens have to work harder. You know, they just can't walk out and bust someone and guarantee conviction. Right. And, you know, the concern was people will abuse this. They will still push the limits of the law and they many will get off by basically just claiming I didn't know, you know, whatever. Um, And there's probably some truth to that. You know, I mean, I'm sure there are people that absolutely would take advantage of that and do take advantage of that if I had to guess. So let me let me go back to one of the articles I found. And um, this was a. Uh, Bud Grant, who I was telling you, the former Minnesota Vikings coach, yep. uh, he became a poster boy. And what happened was exactly what we were talking about. Uh, he and five other guests of Nebraska's state tourism agency were issued $250 federal citations. And this is this article is March 26, 1998. So it says that pretty much, you know, they they went to hunt with an outfitter. They showed up met the outfitter, went to breakfast and went out in the blind, shot some. And then before you know it, he was being arrested. So it said, and I, I missed this, but I was looking at it cause I thought it might have something to do with it. It says, ironically, just a few days after Grant's situation became public, the U S fish and wildlife service announced proposed changes in next fall's baiting laws. So that was, that yep. was your 98. So it yep. would have went into effect in the fall of 98. Yep. And that was a, a snow goose hunt in Illinois. Then uh, I'm not sure if it says he had to pay that or not, but um, yeah, because the timing of that's really unfortunate. Because the one thing that this does do now uh, with the known or should have known standard uh, is basically there's also amendments that make it illegal to place or direct the placement of bait on or adjacent to an area uh, for the purpose of taking or attempting to take migratory game birds. So basically, that's the situation where you've got a guide or a duck club who's baiting spots to bring hunters there unknowingly and harvest birds. Now that guide's on the hook if they can prove that he knew that there was baiting going on, right? Which yep. a lot of times, the thing that always amazes me is when I've heard of these undercover sort of sting operations that you know the federal wardens do and things like that, They actually do quite a bit of investigation. They sit on these places. They watch people, 
you know, harvest birds illegally. Like they let them kill the bird in the game. Then they go and bust them and then they take the game from them. It's like total waste of that animal to prove that crime. I mean, you see that a lot in like dove season and things like that. But um, so that's kind of unfortunate. But basically now with this 98 amendment, uh, these violations are punishable with fines up to $100,000 for individuals and $200,000 for organizations uh, with imprisonment of not more than one year or both. So basically, if you're at a duck club and you're screwing around, you can get slapped at 200K in a year in, in the poke for baiting <laughs> ducks, which that's a steep price to pay, man. I mean, that's no joke right there. Yeah, they're trying to get rid of it. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, you know, I thought uh, that was pretty hefty handed. So I think. Maybe that was sort of the the trade off of like, hey, maybe this is less enforceable, but we are going to make the fines and the pun- the penalties when we can enforce it on you significant. Um, it also says here that uh, at that time, this allowed for fines of the misdemeanor convictions under the uh, Migratory Bird Treaty Act uh, to go up to fifteen k rather than five thousand. So uh, it sounds like maybe uh, for some of those other um, lesser type of scenarios where it's maybe not a commercial organization or something. I don't, I'm not sure exactly where this would be, but you can see it's a it's a, a stiffening of the penalty from a 5k max up to a 15k max. So pretty significant um, fines can be levied for baiting. At this and point. I want to. Um, there's a 2017 a a guide in New York was baiting um, baiting ponds for profit. So he's taking people out a violation of migratory bird treaty act. Um, he was, he had to pay $5,000 and then he also part of a plea bargain included the requirement to make charitable donations, totaling $10,000 to nonprofit wildlife organizations of his choice. And he also had to pay for half page ads within two weeks, uh, apologizing for his actions. (laughs) In, uh, in a, public in, shaming, yeah, in a, in a few uh, in a few news articles. So wow, wow. So I mean, there's your there's your fifteen thousand plus, um, whatever the ads cost. Mm. Yeah, wow. And that was two thousand seventeen. Yeah. So I mean, it's not you know they don't play around with that stuff, and you know. Y- I don't know anyone personally who's ever been hit for baiting, but you see stories, you know, there's always seems like things kind of coming and going and what's what. So, you know, it, it's just one of those things where it's a, it's a sticky situation if someone makes accusations and the, you know, there's that burden of proof, but you know, you've seen it in the media before there people make accusations about people all the time. And, you know, it's just kind of unfortunate to see how that all plays out. But Uh, so that's a little bit of sort of how we got to today, I think. And certainly that's not all encompassing and I'm sure there's things that we've missed that uh, that are of importance. So you can definitely find all that stuff online, read about it yourself, familiarize yourself, but, uh, let's shift gears here and talk about the actual regulation today as it sits. Um, I do want to clarify here. This is coming directly from the, uh, uh, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank here, the Federal uh, uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And basically, they say here that federal baiting regulations are one thing. It's your responsibility to know and obey all of them, uh, both federal and state. And state regulations can be more restrictive than the federal regulations. So don't be complacent and think that the federal regulations are going to be above and beyond what your state does. Uh, It's quite the opposite. Your state has final say. So um, make sure you verify with your state that they match the federal requirement or if they're more strict, you're familiar with those. And then uh, per the federal regulation now, again, this does not apply to states, but it says the waterfowl baiting regulations apply to ducks, geese, swans, coot, and cranes. So Mm -hmm. those are the birds that are covered under, under the, uh, under the regulation. I did want to, um, before we get heavy into baiting, just the from the Fish and Wildlife Service, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act makes it illegal to take, possess, import, export, transport, sell, purchase, barter, or offer for sale, purchase, or barter any migratory bird or the parts, nest, or eggs of such a bird 
under the terms of a valid federal permit. So just to make make sure you're not selling or trading for anything, um, that's just another part of the Treaty Act. So so let's yeah, talk baiting. That always, that always, I always wondered how that would work because, you know, you see like Cabela's and places like that buying taxidermy, right? At least they did at some point. I feel like yeah. there's, I've seen advertisements for that. Maybe those are all just replicas that they make, but I, I thought that at the time they were, you know, sport stores would like try to buy uh, taxidermy and things like that. And I guarantee you, you go to places where there's like garage sales and stuff. You could probably find some old duck mounts float around. Yeah. People want to sell. So, you know, just be careful. Um, also another thing uh, to follow up on my last comment is that uh, the federal regulations are definitely more restrictive for uh, waterfowl hunting than they are for hunting doves and other migratory birds. Um, so make sure that you know, exactly what it is that you're hunting and if you you know feel like if you're hunting for doves specifically uh, make sure you familiarize yourself with those regulations first uh what, what you got going on with the ducks so all right dan you want to start in on this uh the the, the current bait regulation uh sure so you already you already said you know kind of the what is baiting right you cannot hunt waterfowl by the aid of baiting or on or over any baited area where you know or reasonably should know that the area has been baited. Um, so what is baiting? It's the direct or indirect placing, exposing, depositing, distributing, or scattering of salt, grain, or other feed that could lure or attract water fowl to, on, or over any areas where hunters are attempting to take them. Yeah. So, huh. There's a lot of things we're gonna we're gonna talk about that are very vague. <laughs> well, I mean, that's yeah. the thing. I'm I'm reading it, and then like you know, yeah, that's that's okay. I I buy that, but then you say, you know, uh, as we as we'll get down into the the you know further into the regulation, it talks about spillage and things like that that's acceptable within normal farming practices. And I'm like, well, is normal farming practice exposing or indirect placing? I mean, what's normal farming practice considered? You know, I mean, I don't, I don't farm, so I don't know what is normal with with some of that stuff, right? So, a lot of really gray area. Um, and I, I, you know, I know it's not something that I regularly think about when I when I hunt a field, but I'm wondering, like, should I? You know, so. Um, yeah, there's definitely been some times. You know, if, if a farmer has equipment that isn't the best, you're going to get that, you know, overflow or, or whatever it is, some spillage, like you said. But then there's some that, I mean, there's full full cobs, full pieces of corn with kernels not even touched laying yeah. in the field. So, I mean, in that at that point, do you, do you call a game warden? And, and check? My, my gut tells me that most people do not. I think right. I think most people will I to me this is a gut just me thinking through it. I think most people would would more closely associate baiting with a water source where they can like if they can see these things in the water like if you're throwing corn in the shallows and you know and stuff for ducks. I think most people would I think at least me this is me, right? I don't know about most people, but me, I associate that more with baiting. I don't necessarily think about like when I'm in the field hunting, if I see like an ear of corn, like half, you know, half picked over, like laying there, or there's like a spot where there's corn on the ground. I, I don't really think, Oh, sh- oh see, crap. But, like, is this baited? Like, you know? Right. So here's, here's what my thoughts are on that. If you're in a cut corn field that the farmer harvested, that would be normal farming practices, right? They cut it on time and in the time that is usual. So that would be considered not baiting. Right. I, I guess so. But I mean, I've definitely seen fields with more corn in it than others after yep. it's been cut. <laughs> you know? Me too. So who knows? But I've taken, I've taken pictures of big chunks of corn. I've taken pictures with handfuls of corn that I found laying on the ground. Just, yep. you know, anyway, so that's what, that's what the regulation defines as baiting. Now, once a place has been um, considered to be baited, Okay, everybody out there listening, let's see a show of hands. Who knows what the 10-day rule is? Who knew that there was a 10-day rule? Don't freaking lie. A lot of people probably don't. 
<laughs> the baited area remains off limits to hunting for 10 days after that the grain or the salt of the feet or whatever has been completely removed. And basically, it then says that it recognizes that after that 10 day period, uh, waterfowl will still likely be attracted there uh, even after the bait is gone. So this one again to me is like, it's, it's questionable because, yeah, there's, you know, two, there's two sides of this. I think, I think one, if someone was caught baiting, I do believe that some kind of sign goes up okay. say, saying that this is this field or this pond or whatever it is, has been baited and the 10, 10 day rule has, has been applied is now applied or, or if I, I don't know if they make them clean the bait up. I'm assuming in water, Sound, you wouldn't. It sounds like they have to. You would. It, to me, it sounds like the 10 days does not start until it has been completely removed. Right. So that might be by birds. Because well, if yeah, you, if if you put that, tons of bait, yeah, you're out for a while. Yeah, you might lose it for the season. I mean, if yep. they can see a kernel of corn in the water, it's not completely. You know, I mean, I, yep. I don't know how, how you know, stickler they want to be about that. But. but this was, you brought up a good point with this one. Because if it if it's my personal property or something like that, and I'm waiting, say I, <laughs> you know, there's a split, so I bait it, right? Mm -hmm. And then I'm planning on a, I'm going on vacation when the split comes back in, and and then you go and hunt my property while I'm on vacation and don't know, and it's still on day seven or day eight that everything's been gone, right? Like that's, yeah, I mean, I, I think that would, for me, that would fall under the uh, known or should have known maybe. Yep. But then you would be nailed. Like, so that's interesting. I shouldn't so, be. I, I was going to say, you should not be nailed for that because your intent was not for me to hunt that on day eight. Right. That's interesting. You'd have to prove that, right? Or they'd have to prove that, mm -hmm. you, you know, however. But um, yeah, I think that, it gets it gets a really sticky wicket when you get into some of this stuff, and I mean, I would imagine that it's very closely coordinated with the 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 warden or the regulatory uh, you know authorities for that area. That's when something's you know got going on. But um, so this this next part is one that um, could be trouble. I feel like yeah. So this is basically talking you know we're talking, going to talk about hunting agricultural lands and it basically says what you can and can't do. So it says that you can hunt waterfowl and fields of unharvested standing crops. You can also hunt over standing crops that have been flooded. It says you can also flood fields after crops are harvested and use these areas for waterfowl hunting. Um, this next one. Yeah, it's basically saying that the presence of seed or grain in an agriculture area rules out waterfowl hunting unless the seed or grain is scattered solely as a result of normal agricultural planting, harvesting, post-harvest manipulation, or soil stabilization practice. The key word on all of those is normal, like air quotes, right? Like normal harvesting, normal post-harvesting manipulation, normal soil stabilization practice, like who knows what normal is? Like, I definitely don't. Uh, again, I don't farm. So I don't know what normal is. And if the farmer that I hunt on his land doesn't hunt ducks, doesn't care about this regulation, he's probably not going to tell me. He'll go, oh, hey, I didn't, uh, I didn't manipulate the soil as I typically would because of this. So, like, be careful because you might get arrested for baiting. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, he he right, but essentially that's what the rice farmers do, right? You're hunting rice, and they they'll I mean, take I the crop. I don't, I don't I don't hunt a lot of rice here in Virginia, so I'm not sure. <laughs> right, but then the grain's down, and they they flood it. But you you skipped a sentence that I think could could really get people in trouble, and that's hunting waterfowl over a crop that has not been harvested, but that has been manipulated, such as rolled or disked is considered baiting under current regulations. I don't have that sentence where I'm reading, so... Oh, okay. Um, I don't know what you're reading off of. Same. Fish and Wildlife Service page. But 
that for whatever reason, if you, it could, it could have been the same as a, you know, a late snow goose hunt or late, late goose hunt. If something's going on with their crop that it didn't grow correctly, I'm just thinking a cornfield, say you have a drought and your corn is just stumpy, right? And it's not worth harvesting. Mm -hmm. So then they, they disc it. So I'm telling you right now, this is something that I'm finding and I'm going to caution everybody while we're talking about this. If you go on the fish and wildlife um, website and you read, you read the waterfowl hunting and baiting laws there at the very top, it says there's a printable version of this form. Click here for the PDF. I'm reading off of that. And I can tell you right now that sentence is not in there. It is different than what is on the website because I see it on the website. So, mm. So uh, be go. very be very careful. <laughs> Read what's on the website. Maybe stay off the printable version. And that's one. Well, th- what made me think of this is that um, some of the farmers around here, um, which it's not exactly the same. I'm I'm giving the example of of a bad a bad crop getting getting disked right. But a lot of the farmers around here will just go and uh, once they cut the corn, they will just brush hog the fields Mm -hmm. and put their crop, put their, you know, winter wheat or whatever in. So that, that would be fine. But going back to the stumpy corn, if it didn't grow and it's, you know, just really small and they decided to just brush hog that and then say they disc and plant something, that's a baited field. Yeah. Because that was not harvested corn. Even though it wasn't a great crop, they're probably still, you know, ears of corn with kernels. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, it does say that, um, that the, uh, cooperative extension specialists, mm-hmm. uh, CES, they provide a, a wide range of recommendations on case by case basis, but all not all their recommendations may be considered normal planting. So again, this whole thing of like normal, like what is normal? You know, I mean, I feel like they should be a little more directive on that. But anyway, um, and this goes through talking about planting, post-harvest manipulation, manipulation of agricultural crops. Um, I think a lot of that stuff is probably not something we need to hammer too closely here. But the one thing I will say is I'm going to jump down here to wildlife food plots um, and it does mention that you cannot legally hunt waterfowl over fresh, freshly planted wildlife food plots where their seed or grain has been distributed kind of on the surface. So, you know, those food plots where you get, you, you plant stuff down and like, you know, turkeys get in there and start hammering on it, or you plant grass somewhere and geese get in there and hammer it. You can't hunt those, right? That, that would be considered baiting. So, um, I don't know if that happens a lot, but I did think it was kind of me- worth mentioning. I thought also, um, this this reaches hunters everywhere. Hunters should be aware. This is still under the uh, harvesting post harvest manipulation. But hunters should be aware that normal harvesting practices can be unique to specific parts of the country. For example, swathing wheat crops is a part of the normal harvest process recommended by the Co-op Extension Service in some areas of the Upper Midwest. During this process, wheat is cut, placed into rows, and left in the field for several days until it dries. Hunting waterfowl over a swath wheat field during the recommended drying period is legal. It is illegal to hunt waterfowl over swath wheat that becomes unmarketable or that is left in a field past the recommended drying period because these situations are not normal harvest. Mm. So if you cut your wheat, put them in rows, and then get some weird El Nino happening that rains for a few days, and you have it down at either rots it or it's it's in longer than the recommended drying period that potentially could put you in a baiting situation. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's just in you know, the manipulation of crops as I'm reading here, it's talking just like what you're saying. If you know, for whatever reason an agricultural crop or a portion of the crop has not been harvested. Equipment failure, weather, insects, disease, whatever. 
the crop remaining portion uh, that's been that gets manipulated, that area is baited, cannot be hunted for waterfowl, right? Mm-hmm. So, like the example they give is no waterfowl hunting could legally occur on or over a field of sweet corn that's been partially harvested in the remainder mode. And that's so. the thing you get a lot of. <laughs> I'm just thinking around here. You get worms. You know, you, if if someone's not doing uh, insecticides or whatever, you might get some really bad, really bad corn. And mm-hmm. if they open that up, they're say, "We're just going to mow this. You're hunting a baited field." Yep. Simple as that. Real well, quick. And 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 I think the other piece of this that we haven't touched yet is you don't have to actually hunt the baited field to be hunting a baited area. Yeah. And that's this is a, a this is a fun part. This is a huge issue in my opinion this is one of the biggest problems of this of this to understand so basically the way the law reads is that the baited field is one thing the baited area would essentially consist of any area around the bait that would impact bird flight so you know if it's going to divert them off of their normal flight path that is illegal to hunt as well so Basically, you are required to identify how far away you must be from that baited area to legally hunt again. And there is no set distance. It's basically case by case. And they factor things such as topography, uh, topography, weather, waterfowl flight patterns, like who who knows what I mean? What are they going to factor into that to, to to identify that area? And how, as a law abiding hunter, how do you navigate that? Because you could literally be hunting a field at the end of the you know. So let's say I hunt a a farm that I've gotten busted for baiting, and you know, a quarter mile down the road, um, you know, between me and the roost pond is Dan's farm, and he's hunting there, and you know. Is that in the baited area? And if, if it is, is he well, notified? Thing, yeah. If you're trying to, well. Like this, I'm <laughs> trying to bring birds off of that ruse to my farm. Does that make your your farm illegal? Or even if that, say there's, you know, a pond and then I have a, a field and then you're running traffic in between, but that pond is baited and you know those flight patterns. Yeah, if that, for sure. That, that's a. Same thing. You could get nailed for baiting. And the thing that is really worrisome is in, you know, you don't think about it so much around here because, you know, you have the trees and everything. But what about out west? When you're out and you know that you have thousands of birds flying from one spot to another and it might be baited, like that distance, you know, they, they there's no there's no distance. It just mm-hmm. varies. So... The topography, well, if you're in Kansas and everything's flat, you know, what are you going off of? That I think it could be a lot easier in in an area like that. And you could you could take out hundreds of acres of fields and over baiting. Yeah. Yeah. So that's that's a huge issue that needs to be navigated with this. a um, couple other sort of just problem areas that they identify. Um, this is one that I actually have a question for you about. Uh, feeding, get a swig of water there, guy. I did. I'm thirsty. <laughs> so much painting, so much yeah, painting today. Yeah, you gotta hydrate, man. Um, so like feeding waterfowl and other and wildlife, right? So a lot of people feed waterfowl uh, for bird watching, things like that. It's illegal to hunt waterfowl in an area where such feeding has occurred, um, that could allure or attract migratory game birds onto the area, blah, 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 blah. 10, mm-hmm. 10 day rule applies. Um, Tell me how like the spillway at Pimatuming doesn't just create that whole area as a baiting thing. I mean, there's ducks, there's ducks all over the place getting bread thrown at them for six months out of the year. But here's the thing. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and, and September, the thing is usually when it starts getting colder, the carp, um, go, they stop coming to the top. And I believe at least the the place that the spillway closes down around that time. So you know, but there's you can no still break show up there and just chuck wa- no, chuck uh, bread into the water for the geese. There's no doubt that's a big part. And, and then people hunt you know, right across the road. Banded mallards all over the place, right there, and people are hunting literally right across the road from it. Yep. I find it very interesting. Um, and they they sky bust right right yeah. across the road as they're yep. going across. So that yep. 
Another you might, pro. You might close down my hunting spot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, that thing's like super regulated, so I'm sure that they've thought about that. You know, I mean. Well, then they, they run. They run, they run hunts. hunts. Yeah, yeah, they run I mean, managed hunts there. They do all kinds of stuff over there, so it just seems weird. Um, it also says on here that some areas that um, it's legal to hunt. Um, it's a legal hunting practice to place grain to att- uh, to att- attract some state protected game species. Like you know, if it's legal to hunt white tailed deer over grain bins or something like that, those areas are going to be illegal for waterfowl hunting, and the ten day rule would apply. So if your neighbor is legally baiting for deer, that could impact you. Um, you know, it just seems like there's a lot. That, you know, it's kind of like Pandora's box almost with some of this stuff. It can go. I saw some something on Facebook. It was an article, and a guy got um, he got arrested, and I forget how many tons of corn he put out to feed deer. But he was killing deer like he had to have a dump truck load. And just dropped it all. <laughs> he ended up, they must have found that that was not, uh, that was, I don't know, because it was legal, it, wherever it was at, it was legal to, to bait, but that amount was absurd. So he got, he got nailed. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's wild. Um, I don't want to beat this too much more, I don't think, but I do want to, you know, it does list in here what's legal, what's illegal goes in depth on some of these things, but not a ton. Uh, the one area I would say that's also potentially uh, dangerous here for some of our, our applications would be areas where grain and feed and things are used for feeding livestock. So if they've got feed out in the fields for livestock and you're hunting like a, like a, like a pond in a livestock, um, you know, pasture or something like that, maybe that could be another area where you're potentially treading on thin ice. I'm not really sure, but mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I could see that happening. Uh, but basically, it, it talks a little bit about the responsibilities of the hunter, right? And mm-hmm. this is the thing that I think is important because this is what the law is saying is on us. As the hunter, no matter what your situation, this one's on you. And basically, it comes down to is that you're responsible for determining whether your hunting area is baited. So before you hunt, you should do the following. So you tell me, Dan, how many times have you done these, Okay. Familiarize yourself with federal and state waterfowl hunting regulations. Yes. Yep. Ask the landowner, your host or guide, or your hunting partners if the area has been baited and inspect the area for the presence of bait. Suspect the presence of bait if you see waterfowl feeding in a particular area in an unusually large concentrations or display a lack of caution. Once. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Look for grain and other feeds in the water along the shore and on the, and in the field. Pay particular attention to the presence of spilled grain on harvested fields and seeds planted by means of top sowing. Yeah, I mean, I I always look for it. Yeah, no, I would I say that. Know. I would say, um, but here's 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 my caveat to that. If you're hunting a, a pond, let's just say, and you get there in the morning and you're setting decoys, maybe you'd see something like that with your headlamp. But if you don't, you're not seeing that until the first bird's down, probably. Right. And you're out there trying to get your dog to retrieve it or whatever. So uh, that makes it tough. Um, basically, it's also saying to confirm that the scattered seeds or grains on an agricultural lands are uh, solely as a result of normal agriculture uh, planting or harvesting or post-manipulation, whatever. I don't think anybody validates that other than just look at it and does it seem weird or not. There's been multiple times I said this might be the worst farmer in America, but yeah, it was it was normal practice. Well, it's saying you know that you should confirm that those are normal with the co-op service. Mm -hmm. I don't think many people are doing that. And then abandon the hunting site if you find grain or feed in an area and are uncertain about why it's there. I mean, if it's like out of place, I could see that being pretty, yeah, pretty clear. So, I don't know, man. I mean, I think we've covered a lot on this. There's, I think we've definitely sort of highlighted the fact that there's a lot to take in, mm-hmm. a lot to understand, uh, and a lot of responsibility on the hunter to make sure that you know what you're getting into. Yep. So, uh, all of the stuff that we've talked about today is on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service website. It's very easy to find. Google, you know. Bait law stuff, it'll get you there really quickly. Um, 
But I hope you know that this at least gives you an idea of exactly what goes into the baiting regulations. And I'm sure there's going to be tons of people out there that have had uh, various experiences with game wardens and baiting and not baiting and, you know, sort of having to prove that you're, you weren't hunting a known baited site, things like that. So I'm sure there's a lot of stories that will be coming across our social media feeds and stuff dealing with this next week. Yep. Um, one other thing, maybe two other things. <clears throat> Tagging. You cannot put or leave waterfowl at any place or in the custody of another person unless you tag the birds with your signature address, number of birds identified by species, and the date you killed them. Okay. So make sure you're not giving birds away without, uh, you know, tagging them or for whatever reason they have them in their truck and not your truck. Um, I think another thing to be worried about is rallying, as as they call it. Uh, you cannot hunt waterfowl that have been concentrated, driven, rallied, or stirred up with a motorized vehicle or sailboat. And I would contest that driving to another field to get birds up and out might fall under that if you think that they would fall into your spread. Yeah, I'm sure they would not look uh, look highly on someone jumping a big roost pond if they caught them doing it. Yep. You know, I'm, I'm sure. Not jump, you know, like someone, you know, oh, there's a private property area. I don't have a gun. I just drive my truck over there, jump out, sprint over across there, boot a bunch of birds out and jump back in my truck and run. One last thing that you hear about being at public places and people breast out birds and throw the rest there. You cannot completely field dress waterfowl before taking them from the field. The head or one fully feathered wing must remain attached to the birds while you transport them to your home or to a facility that processes waterfowl. Yeah. So for and, any and of those people some, that do that, some, I hope that they get some, nailed. In some, some states, it require different things on that as well. Right. So definitely know your state requirement for that. Whew, okay. Well. Is there anything else on that you think we need to hit before we wrap up this week? Man, I think. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, that was I was I just found that illegal hunting methods from or by means aid or use of any motor vehicle, motor driven land conveyance or aircraft. Um, yeah, I mean we didn't really get, we didn't really get into that stuff because we're kind of focused on the baiting thing. on the baiting, but that's uh, so that would be you know if you're driving to do that you'd be in trouble Mm -hmm. yeah all right well you got one last thing that doesn't have to do with baiting that you want to hit on oh man uh i don't think so i think that was a a lot of info there and um like i said uh, it's not just for new hunters i think people might uh raise an eyebrow to some of this and think about what they're doing this coming year yeah i mean i think you have to right i mean you can't afford to get caught in a bad situation and you're not going to get off the hook by just saying you didn't know the law, didn't know that was right. a thing. I mean, they're not going to have a lot of, not going to have a big appetite for that. So it's your responsibility to know it. So make sure you're plugged in. And hopefully this episode helps you do that a little bit uh, easier and get you in the right direction on finding more information on the topic if you need to. Um, I think this has been a really quality conversation and uh, we'll kind of wrap it up on that. But before we do, do want to take a minute just to thank Yukonuba, Gunner Kennels, 737 Duck and Goose Calls, and Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the world's most comprehensive online gun dog training resource. They've got over 160 instructional videos. It includes everything you need to take your seven week old puppy to a finished gun dog. Visit CornerstoneGunDogAcademy.com, sign up for your free preview module, and begin your training journey today. Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. All right, that does it for episode 143. Hopefully you enjoyed our talk about waterfowl baiting laws. You learned a little bit and hopefully keep you out of trouble if you find yourself in a situation where there's a baited field or baited area where you hunt. If you're new to the show, you can head over to iTunes, get caught up on all of our past episodes. And while you're there, you can leave us a five-star rating and review. It'll help us connect with more hunters just like you. That's going to do it for this week. Until next week, for Dan, I'm Josh. Take care. Take care.